We're going through the macromolecules. We've covered carbohydrates, now we're covering lipids. Remember that lipids don't fall into this plan of monomers linking together to form polymers. They have been not applicable under both monomers and polymers. So they're not going to follow this nice, neat model. What do we mean when we're talking about lipids? Well, this is a partial list. These are the ones you need to know about for this course. We're going to be talking about the fats, which includes fatty acids and triglycerides, phospholipids, which we've already talked about a little bit when we talked about water shaping nonpolar molecules or forcing the shape of cell membranes, cholesterol and the cholesterol-based hormones, and then waxes. So these are a very diverse group of molecules. What they have in, in common is that lipids are all nonpolar. If you're nonpolar, do you mix with water or not mix with water? You don't mix with water. Remember, polar bears like water. Polar molecules mix with water, nonpolar do not. They are hydrophobic. So this is something that unites all lipids. We're going to start by just visually recognizing a fatty acid, and I'm going to draw it as a six carbon molecule, even though in reality it would be much longer than that, because I want you to compare with carbohydrates. So this is a lipid. Again, it would be much longer than this, but I'm going to draw it as a six carbon molecule so you can compare with a carbohydrate. Let's start with this difference. Remember the carbohydrate? We had a carbonyl group here. Oops. A carbon double bonded to an oxygen. But remember, this functional group has a different name. Its name and its structure are really a combination of carbonyl and hydroxyl, and it's called carboxyl. So rather than having a carbonyl group, the lipid is going to have a carboxyl group. Here's the other difference. Rather than having multiple hydroxyl groups, the lipid is just just going to be a hydrocarbon chain. Remember, a hydrocarbon chain is a chain of just carbon and hydrogen. It does not have multiple hydroxyl groups. Hydrocarbon chain. This hydrocarbon chain is nonpolar. It does not mix with water. Okay, I'm just going to quickly draw the carbohydrate just to compare. Carbonyl group. Sorry, I would include the carbon there. And then multiple hydroxyl groups. Hydroxyl groups mixed with water. Hydrocarbon chain does not mix with water. Carbohydrates are polar, hydrophilic, water-loving. Okay, so this is a carbohydrate. This is glucose. This would be a lipid. Okay, so let's start by talking about the fats and the fatty acids, which this is really a short fatty acid that I've drawn. And in fact, I'm going to leave this on the board. I'm going to erase some of this other part here. But you've probably heard two terms associated with fats. Actually, three terms that we're going to use today, all of which I know you have heard. I know that you've heard the terms saturated fat and unsaturated fat. And I'm sure you've also heard the term trans fat. We're going to talk about what those three terms mean today. You've probably also heard the term triglyceride, and we're going to talk about what that means. So in the world of fats, we have what are called saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Those are more appropriately called saturated fatty acids 
and unsaturated fatty acids. We're going to talk about the difference in structure between the two and what the sources are of each and what the chemical properties are of each. So let's start with saturated fatty acids. What I draw on the board already, this is a very short saturated fatty acid. Why is it called saturated? Remember, carbon has to share electrons with four other atoms, or it has to share four pairs of electrons. It can have double bonds, but it has to share four pairs of electrons. So each of these carbons, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, etc. Because they're all single bonds, they are saturated with hydrogen. They're holding the maximum number of hydrogens they could possibly hold. Remember, if we put a, a double bond between two of these carbons, it's not going to be able to hold as many hydrogens. So it's completely saturated with hydrogen. And that's one of the first characteristics of a saturated fatty acid is no double bonds between carbons. They're all single bonds. And what this does is it makes the molecule very linear. So this molecule, because there aren't any double bonds, is very linear. When you have a double bond between carbons, that molecule is going to tend to form a kink on either side, a band on either side of that, that really rigid double bond. And we'll see that in the next category of fat. So no double bond between carbons. It's a very linear molecule. And for this reason, these tend to clump together very easily at room temperature, which means they are solid at room temperature. Solid at room temperature because they can clump together, because they're very linear. And these are typically what we call the animal fats. Animal fats, and that includes dairy. Okay, so this would be any fat that you eat on an animal. So when you're eating that skeletal muscle, doesn't that sound yummy? <laughs> eating a skeletal muscle? It's covered in fat, and that is an animal fat. So when you eat a fattier meat, such as you know, a piece of pork or a piece of steak that actually has a fat layer on it, that's obviously an animal fat. We typically call that lard when we separate it out. So this would include lard. It also includes butter and any other form of dairy fat. Do we typically think of these as being healthy? No, but we do need them. They are a very important part of our diet. They're not unhealthy if you eat them in moderation. You don't want to be eating butter all day, every day. But it's actually much healthier for you than margarine that my generation was fed because our parents thought butter was making us fat. They started feeding us margarine, which has trans fats, which we'll talk about in a minute. But animal fat in moderation is fine. We have evolved to be able to process animal fats. Animal fats are not what is killing us. So saturated fatty acids, very linear. They tend to be solid at room temperature. And these are the animal fats, including dairy fats. Unsaturated fatty acids do have double bonds between carbons and are not linear. Because as I just mentioned, what happens is when you have this double bond between carbons, you tend to get a bend, a kink in the chain on either side of that double bond. That double bond is very rigid. The carbons can't rotate around that bond and it tends to form a bend. So if I just continue this chain, hydrogens, obviously this would go on for more carbons in this chain. But remember, four pairs of electrons have to be shared. So this carbon, one, two, it needs two hydrogens. 
these two carbons, okay, look at this one. It already has three pairs of electrons being shared. One, two, three. So it can only hold one hydrogen. Same for this guy. One, two, three. It can only hold one hydrogen. This guy needs two. This guy would need three if he's at the end, but he's going to keep going and connect other carbons. Okay, so this would be an unsaturated fatty acid. These do have double bonds, at least one double bond between carbons. Not linear, there is a bend in the chain. And these cannot clump together. Because of that bend, they can't clump together at room temperature. And they therefore tend to be liquid at room temperature. These are the plant oils, nut oils, fish oils. Although coconut oil actually falls in the saturated category, but sunflower oil, um, other nuts that can produce oil, peanut oil, fish oils, plant oils, these are all unsaturated fatty acids. They cannot clump together at room temperature because of this bend in the chain. So let's just quickly look at the picture of that. That's a triglyceride. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Okay, so this would be the saturated fat. Very linear, and those can clump together. And then this would be the bend in the unsaturated fat. So what is a trans fat? Well, let's think back to our geometric isomers. Cis and trans configuration. What does cis mean? Remember, geometric isomers require a double bond between carbons. And then we're looking at what's attached to those carbons. Is it on the same side or across? Same is cis. So would this be the cis isomer or the trans isomer? This would be the cis isomer. This is a cis isomer for an unsaturated fatty acid. If we switch this and put this hydrogen on the flip side, if it looked like this, so here's our double bond. This is what we call the trans configuration. And what this does is it straightens out this chain. Let me show you a picture. So this is a cis fat and this is a trans fat. Notice this chain gets straight. So now this used to be a healthy, unsaturated fatty acid. And what they've done is artificially changed the configuration so now it can be straight. And now it can clump together at room temperature. Have you ever looked at peanut butter in the jar and some of the peanut butter, like Skippy and Jif, is all creamy and mixed together, all nice and pretty on the shelf. And then you have the natural peanut butter that's all separated and has that oil layer floating on the top. Well, they thought we don't like the look of that. So what they did is made those vegetable oils, those nut oils, those plant-based oils, straight, and now they clump together, and they're solid at room temperature. So when you're making cookies, when you're making Twinkies, when you're making Hostess cupcakes, and you want them to have a long shelf life, 
you add trans fat. You hydrogenate that fat. Another term for trans fat that you'll see on labels is hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. That should signal you that you should not eat it. It's an artificial form of fat. It's because we want products to stay on the shelf for longer without spoiling. If they put butter or a very healthy plant oil in those cookies and cupcakes and Twinkies, the shelf life would be very much reduced. So this allows products to stay on the shelf longer. Crackers, cookies, all kinds of packaged items. We have not evolved to be able to process these fats. They are not natural. These fats clog your arteries. That is especially critical when you're talking about those tiny little coronary arteries that serve your heart tissue. That heart is beating all day long. That muscle never stops working until you die. So we want to make sure we don't clog those. Trans fats are very bad for you. The FDA requires that trans fats be called out on products only if they are above a certain amount. Just because this is zero, zero trans fat doesn't mean there's no trans fat. You need to look at the label, and if it says hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated, you need to know what that means. So trans fat is not good. Saturated and unsaturated fats in their normal healthy form are fine. In fact, we need a certain amount of lipid in our diet so we can make cell membranes, so we have normal immune function, so we have normal neurological function. It's especially important in developing children, babies in developing children, really need a certain amount of fat in their diets. Okay, so essential fatty acids. And this term is going to apply when we talk about amino acids too. Essential fatty acids. The body needs them, but they have to come from your diet. So must come from diet. Body cannot produce them. You need to know this term, essential fatty acids, but you don't need to know omega-6, omega-3, omega-9. You don't need to know these terms, but let's talk about this for a minute. Omega-9, these are the non-essential fatty acids. Your body can take other parts and pieces from the essential fatty acids and produce these. Here are some examples of them. Safflower oil, sunflower oil, chicken fat, duck fat, goose fat, turkey fat, peanut oil, canola oil. Canola oil is healthy, but it's not an essential fatty acid. Your body can take the other fatty acids and assemble this same type of omega-9 fatty acid. Omega-6 and omega-3, I'm sure you've heard these terms before. Omega-6 includes things like Corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, omega-3, these are the fish oils, salmon, also walnuts, flax seeds. So these are just some quick examples of the different fatty acids that your body needs. Fats are very important. Again, we're going to need fats to make membranes. I want to just quickly skip back to triglycerides. Triglycer I'm sorry, triglycerides might seem like a polymer, but really they're not. What a triglyceride is, is it's a glycerol with three fatty acids connected. How do these connect? Dehydration, removing an H and an OH and linking those together. This is what it looks like when they're all linked together. This is how we have fats in our bloodstream. The fats in our bloodstream are triglycerides. Again, it's not really a polymer because it's not three of the same thing linked together. This glycerol 
is linked to three fatty acids. This glycerol is not the same as those fatty acids. So triglyceride is glycerol. plus three fatty acids. And you can see that those fatty acids can be saturated or unsaturated. These fatty acids shown here all are, I'm, I'm sorry, they're all saturated. So that's what triglycerides are. Saturated fat, unsaturated fat. There was our cis and trans configuration of the unsaturated. By the way, these are called unsaturated because they're not completely saturated. So they're only holding two hydrogens instead of four because of that double bond. Okay, phospholipids. Remember, phospholipids are a very important part of our cell membranes. And just another example of why we need lipids in our diet, think of how much membrane you have. If you think every single cell, the whole plasma membrane on the outside, the nuclear envelope, all those membrane-bound structures and organelles in the cell, that really isn't the shape of one, <laughs> the mitochondrial membranes, both the inner and outer membranes of the mitochondrion, all made of phospholipids. And remember, a phospholipid is bipolar in that it has a polar head and then two nonpolar tails. You see here, this one would be saturated, no double bonds. This one would be unsaturated. It does have a double bond. So water-loving head, water-fearing tails, and remember that water then when it interfaces with these phospholipids, it's going to cause them to either form a micelle, if the water's just on the outside, but if the water's outside and inside, then we're gonna get a phospholipid bilayer forming. And this is what our cell membranes look like. So water on the outside of the cell, water on the inside of the cell. All those water-fearing tails are gonna point in away from the water. So phospholipids have a polar head, that's the phosphate group at the head, and then nonpolar tails, and that's because they're a hydrocarbon chain. So phospholipids are a very important category of lipid. Cholesterol. This is cholesterol. Cholesterol gets a bad rap, but there's, there's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. We need cholesterol in our diet. It's an important part of our cell membranes. You're gonna see that it's integrated into these phospholipids. And it's also what we use to make two very important hormones. So some hormones are proteins. We've already looked at insulin and glucagon. Those are two hormones that are proteins. Hormones can also be lipids, especially the, the cholesterol-based hormones, estrogen and testosterone. Okay, so again, cholesterol is an important component of our cell membranes. And you'll see that again in more detail when we look at the plasma membrane. And then it's also what we use to make estrogen and testosterone. It's pretty crazy to look at how similar in structure estrogen and testosterone are, and yet truly very different effects of those two hormones. If you're a developing baby and suddenly testosterone starts moving through your bloodstream, you're going to become a boy. You're, gonna, you're going to develop male genitalia that looks very different from female genitalia. These two hormones have dramatically different effects, but look how similar they are. So here's cholesterol, which is the base for these two hormones. And then look at how similar testosterone and estrogen look to each other. Estradiol and testosterone. 
two very different physiological effects. Again, remember, shape is key. The body recognizes those as being different, even though they're very similar in, in structure. Okay, and then finally, the last category of lipids are the waxes. Waxes aren't that significant, obviously, to humans, because really, earwax, that's pretty much our only wax. But for some plants and animals, it's very important, in particular amphibians. So for plants and for amphibians, waxes are very important. What do you think they do for plants? And for that matter, amphibians. If you're covered in this waxy coating, what's it going to help you do? What are you going to retain more of if you're covered in wax? You retain more water. It keeps you from drawing out. So here would be waxes on a leaf, and then this would be waxes on a frog. Frogs actually have glands that secrete wax, and they can use their little hind legs and move that wax all the way up their little backs, so you can see how shiny he is from that wax. Keeps him from drawing out. Amphibians are still very dependent on the water, but they do come onto land, and this is going to help them keep from drying out as readily as they would. So. Prevent desiccation. Prevent drying out. Okay, so those are the lipids. Again, they don't follow this monomer linking together to form polymer plan, but they're very, very important. And what they all share is that they're all nonpolar. They do not mix with water. So in the next unit, we're going to talk about proteins and they're going to be very linked with nucleic acids, so we'll be talking about the two of those categories of macromolecule together.